Euzu billahi mineşşeytanirracim. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Elhamdülillahi rabbil alamin. Ve salatu ve selamu ala seyyidina Muhammedin ve ala alihi ve sahbihi ecmaîn. Allahumme allimna ma yanfa'una ve anfa'ana bima 'allamtana ve zidna ilmen nafi'a. Allahumme erinel hakka hakkan ve erzukna ittiba'a ve erinel batıla batılan ve erzukna ictinabe. Rabbi şrahli sadri ve yessirli emri ve hlul uqdeten min lisani yefkahu kavli. Esselamu aleyküm ve rahmetullahi ve berekatuh. Welcome to the Reflections on the Risale-i Nur by Bedi Özdeman Said Nursi podcast series. This is Mustafa Tuna. You can le- listen to the episodes of this series wherever you listen to your podcasts or at the website www.reflections-rn.org. A rough translation of the text we will be reading and reflecting upon today in this episode, inshallah, will be posted at this website too. You can go to the podcast, then the words, then the 12th word. And that is what we are going to be reading today, inshallah. The 12th word. This is a comparison between the perspective of the Quran and worldly perspectives. And it is very aptly placed after the 11th word in which Ustad Nursi showed us a glimpse of that Quranic perspective, that perspective th- through which we can look to see the reality, the hidden but tremendous reality of the world that is veiled behind physical appearances. So, Bismillah, 12 Söz, the 12th word. أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم ومن يؤت الحكمة فقد أوتي خيرا كثيرا This is from the second chapter of the Quran Surah Al-Baqarah and verse 269 And whoever is given wisdom is indeed given much good or abundant good Kur'an-ı Hakim'in hikmeti kutsiyesi ile felsefe hikmetinin icmalen muvazenesi hem hikmeti Kur'aniyenin insanın hayatı şahsiyesine ve hayatı içtimaiyesine verdiği dersi terbiyenin gayet kısa, kısa bir fezlekesi hem Kur'an'ın sair kelimat-ı ilahiyeye ve bütün kelamlara cihet rücaniyetine bir işarettir. İşte bu sözde dört esas vardır. So having read that Uh, that sentence from the Quran, uh, verse 269 of Surah Al-Baqarah, and whoever is given wisdom is indeed given much good, Ustad Nursi uh, moves on and tells us that inspired from this verse, the coming treatise is going to be about this. This comprises a concise comparison of the sacred wisdom of the wisdomful Qur'an and the wisdom of philosophy. So the first thing that we will try to understand in reading this treatise, the 12th word, is the difference between the sacred wisdom of the wisdomful Qur'an and the wisdom of philosophy. And a brief summary of the lesson that it, the Qur'an, delivers to organize the personal and social lives of human beings and an indication of the Quran's preponderance over other divine words and all speeches. There are four principles in this word. So the discussion revolves around the notion of wisdom and that we can understand as the purpose, objective, uh, aim that is being sought in something. For instance, the wisdom of, let's say, our usual example, a tree. What could that be? 
what could be the wisdom of a tree the purpose the objective the aim well in one sense that would be its fruit let's say it is a an apple tree the apple would be the the wisdom in planting the tree so the wisdom that the farmer is seeking in planting that tree and watering and taking care of that tree and nurturing it is well picking up the apples so this is one way to look at it however there may be more than one wisdoms you can pursue more than one purpose objective in doing something the wisdom behind that tree may also be manifesting god's names and giving conscious beings an opportunity to know about god through the signs that are placed on it so wisdom therefore has this notion of going deeper deeper in meanings too and how do we know those purposes how do we know those uh, aims and deeper meanings well from the connections of things so wisdom in that sense also implies connections between things everything in the cosmos in the creation relates to one another in multiple ways and through those relations everything <clears throat> at least on the face of it enables the existence of other things now i said on the face of it because in reality it is only and only god who is making things exist however as we say this is a world of wisdom meaning that we see things connected to one another and functioning in a system that appears to be self uh, self-functioning and there's a wisdom in that too if that were not the case there would be no test there is a test and trial in this world for conscious beings like us human beings a gate is opened before the intellect to see the reality behind these appearances but the choice is not taken away from its hands therefore if a person does not make that that move in his heart and incline towards seeing the reality as reality is and submitting to the lord of the entire cosmos entire creation then it can look at things and maybe see a self-functioning system and think that well there is nothing beyond this it is all uh, you know everything is making everything else so that is also wisdom a kind of wisdom a kind of uh, knowledge that tells us about the relations between things but it does not take us to the actual source of things it does not take us to the the relationship that actually matters which is the relationship between the creation and the creator so with that introduction this treatise comprises a concise comparison of the sacred wisdom of the wisdomful quran and the wisdom of philosophy a brief summary of the lesson that it delivers to organize the personal and social lives of human beings and an indication of the quran's preponderance over other divine words and all speeches there are four principles in this word inshallah in this episode we will try to read the first one hikmeti kur'aniye ile hikmeti fenniyenin farklarına şu gelecek hikayeyi temsiliye dürbünü ile bak look at the differences between the quranic wisdom and the scientific wisdom through the binocular of this coming representational story and we are used to this by now Ustad Nursi in most of his treatises most of his lessons first gives us a an allegorical story a representational story it's an easy thing you may you know 
you you may uh, read that story to a small child to entertain the child in many cases it's simple clear it's just a story about the uh, you know concrete world that we live in but it sets a cognitive pattern in our minds and then when we take that pattern and fill it use it to understand some further complex realities it all fits and then makes it easier for us to understand those complex abstract metaphysical realities look at the differences between the quranic wisdom and the scientific wisdom through the binocular of this coming representational story that's why it is a binocular we look through it we look with it it is an instrument and we need to be clear about that this the, these stories are instruments that are, they are not the end that we are uh, pursuing we are seeking we are seeking the reality that is to come through them therefore if there are things in this story that may not fully fit reality as reality is well that's because reality as reality is is sublime and uh, abstract and beyond this concrete world we are only using this as an instrument to get closer to an understanding of that therefore we ignore those parts those parts that do not necessarily fit the higher reality we take the good take the best and if there are some you know parts pieces and parts that are not fully applicable we put them on the side bir zaman hem dindar hem gayet sanatkar bir hakimi namdar istedi ki Kur'an hakimi meanisindeki kutsiyetine ve kelimatındaki icaza şayeste bir yazı ile yazsın. O muciz numa kamete harika bir libas giydirsin. Once a renowned ruler who was pious and utmostly skilled in arts wanted to write the wisdom for Quran with a script worthy of the sacredness of its meanings and the miraculousness of its words and that a wondrous raiment would be put on that miraculous stature the miraculous stature of the the the loft the meanings that are uh, contained in the wisdom for Quran İşte o nakkaş saat Kur'an'ı pek acip bir tarzda yazdı. Bütün kıymetdar cevherleri yazısında istimal etti. Hak- hakaikanın tenevvüne işaret için bazı mücessem hurufatını elmas bir zümrütle ve bir kısmını lü'lü ve akikle ve bir taifesini pırlanta ve mercanla ve bir nevini altın ve gümüşle yazdı. Hem öyle bir tarzı da süslendirip münakkaş etti ki okumayı bilen ve bilmeyen herkes temaşasından hayran olup istihsan ederdi. Bahusus ehli hakikatin nazarına o suri güzellik manasındaki gayet parlak güzelliğin ve gayet şirin tezinatın işaratı olduğundan pek kıymetli bir antika olmuştur. So once again, again there is this renowned ruler, this esteemed person utmostly skilled and and pious and wisdomful wise and he sees the quran the wisdomful quran and see sees the meanings in it and appreciates the worth and value of those meanings and wants to match the form in which those meanings are presented with the value and loftiness of the meanings and therefore wants to write it inscribe it with a in a precious way so that person who was an embroiderer scribed the quran in an amazing fashion he utilized all sorts of precious gems in his script in order to signify the variations in its truths he wrote some of its embodied letters with diamond and emerald others with pearl and agate a group of them with brilliants and corals and a species among them with gold and silver he embroidered them in such an ornamented fashion that everybody whether they knew how to read or not and this is important let's keep this in mind everybody whether they knew how to read or not 
would be filled with admiration and appreciated upon beholding. Now, it, if it were just uh, scribed using black ink in a regular uh, script, only those who knew how to read would be able to understand the meanings contained in it after reading it and appreciate it. But now it is written in such a way that indicates the worth and value of those meanings not only because of the glitter and glamour that is put in there but also because of the variations in the in the ways meanings are represented right now it is even more expressive he embroidered them in such an ornamented fashion that everybody now whether they knew how to read or not everybody would be filled with admiration and appreciated upon beholding just see it and you are filled with admiration just as a side note uh, Ustad Nursi had a Quran and this was a Quran written with what is known and what what, what is uh, what was widely used and it is still used uh, as the Khat Uthman the, the Osman script. This scribe, when he was writing the Quran, took the longest verse of the Quran, which is a verse in Surah Al-Baqarah about um, depths, as the measure for a page in his writing. So he wrote that, that uh, verse and said, okay, this is the length, average length that I'm going to uh, use as a standard for each of my pages and then he took the the surat al-ikhlas right for the length of each of his lines so, or it should be the other way around he first writes surat al-ikhlas and says okay this is the measure for standard for my lines and then he takes that long verse in surat al-baqarah and says this is the length for my pages so he was taking his standard from the quran it was not random because i mean if you think of it it you know you can have 25 lines on a page or you can have 10 lines on a page you can have if you write with a very fine script you can have a hundred lines on a page so what is the standard right so he said okay let me do this and he had you know the, the average legible size of letters and using that he came up with the length of a line using surat al-ikhlas and then he came up with the length of a page using uh, that verse from surat al-baqarah and then he wrote the quran when Ustad Nursi was reading this Quran, he noticed that there were many congruences in the script. And this is what we mean with, with, with uh, congruences. For instance, the word Allah on many pages, right? they would line up. The words Allah would line up from like top down with very small movements, perhaps. Other names of God would also line up. And then there were many other words that would line up or sometimes it would not line up on a single page but if you uh, you know marked one uh, name of god on a, uh, on a page say allah and then pierced through it you would all go allah allah allah allah allah he was amazed and he said he started to pay some more serious attention to this and then kept marking on his quran and he marked the entire quran by pointing out these congruences and then one of his students, Ahmed Khulusi, wrote it and he had a beautiful script. He has a beautiful script. It is available now. I, actually, when I read the Quran, I usually use his script. Um, he wrote it with that beautiful script and he co color coded. So whenever he wrote Allah, for instance, he would use, let's say, pink or red. Whenever he uh, saw some of those words that were lining up in the Quran, he would use you know a color a red and then it, it it became this amazing piece of art and a script that you can look you can look and even if you don't know how to read you will notice that there is something special about this you can show it to a three-year-old child now you know one might think so what's the what's the big deal about this right you can always write the text and then you know line things up and color code etc no you cannot do it this is a this is a fixed 
text. It was revealed 1400 something years ago and has not changed a bit since then. And then that standard of the length of the page and the line that also came from the Quran. So this was not intentionally, I mean, of course, there, there is intent in, in God's will. God will that it to be as such and as a miracle, right? But this was not intended by a human being who sat down as, okay, how can I line things up? Let me write the text. And each time I come to this point in the sentence, I have to use the same word again, etc. No, that's not how it happened. It was written and it was discovered. It was there and it was discovered. Right? So it is, it is a miraculous uh, script. Take a look. You will be amazed how many, how many uh, words are lining up, how much congruence is in there in the text. So like that, like that, he embroidered. Now we are going back to our stories, to, the, to this uh, renowned ruler who wanted to have the Quran written or who wanted to write the Quran in this beautiful and uh, bejeweled uh, script. He embroidered them in such an ornamented fashion that everybody, whether they knew how to read or not, would be filled with admiration and appreciated upon beholding. Because that outer beauty signified the utmost brilliant beauty and utmost lovely adornments in its meanings. Now, the beauty and adornments belong to what? This is important to, to, to notice. The beauty and the adornments belong to the meanings and the outer beauty signifies that real, uh, real hidden meaning, and, right? So, because that outer beauty signified the utmost brilliant beauty and utmost lovely adornments in its meanings, the, the Quran's wisdom for Quran's meanings, it became the final work, the, the scripted uh, bound copy became a really precious antique, especially in the sight of the people of truth not in the sight of literate people who can read it but people of truth people who are ready to take truth as truth is who are humble enough to accept truth when they and where they see it because that outer beauty signified the utmost brilliant beauty and utmost lovely adornments in its meanings it became a really precious antique especially in the sight of the people of truth and of course of course if if this person knows how to read, he will not only understand that there is meaning, lofty meaning behind this, but also have access to what, to, to what those meanings are. But those who don't know how to read, if they notice that there is precious, valuable, lofty meaning behind this, they will be yearning to learn how to read it. But those who don't recognize this, what they want, they want, even if they know how to read, they will not read because they will not think of it as signifying meanings. Sonra o hakim, şu musanna ve murassa Kur'an'ı bir ecnevi filozofa, bir Müslüman alime ve bir Müslüman alime gösterdi. Hem tecrübe hem mükafat için emretti ki, her biriniz bunun hikmetine dair bir eser yazınız. Then, that ruler showed that artful and bejeweled Kur'an to a European philosopher. So the word here uh, that's used, Ajnabi, if we were to make a literal translation, Northern would be the uh, word. But if you think of it, uh, if you think of uh, the, the lands of Islam traditionally being in North Africa and the Middle East and uh, the, the non-Muslims that they interacted most with uh, the Europeans being to their north, Ajnabi here actually means European. And in the 19th and 20th centuries, in the, uh, the, the imagine, imagination and imaginaries of uh, Muslims living in these geographies, it became the Westerners, right? Uh, but the more precise translation is, is European, and that historically works too. Then, that ruler showed that artful and bejeweled Quran to a European philosopher and a Muslim scholar. A European philosopher and a Muslim scholar. 
in order both to try and reward them, he commanded, each of you compose a work on the wisdom of this, on the wisdom of this copy, this book that I am giving to you. Evvela o filosof, sonra o alim, ona dair birer kitap telif ettiler. First that philosopher, and then that scholar, each authored a book about this. Now when we say philosopher, we do not necessarily mean uh, a person who engages, who is specializing in the discipline of philosophy that is taught in particular departments at universities today. Rather, when we say philosophy, we mean a person who is engaged, involved in an investigation of truth by looking at the material world without reference to revelation. Uh, philosophy used to be this overarching branch of, uh, of, of uh, discipline, examination, study of the sensible realm and relations of ideas in order to acquire knowledge of existence. So it, it included many sciences, arts and sciences that we today know as separate disciplines in it. So biology was a part of philosophy, chemistry was a part of philosophy. I mean, it did not exist as such. Biology did not exist as biology. Chemistry did not exist as biology. They all branched out of, of, of uh, philosophy. And then, you know, philosophy by itself was left as, a, as one discipline among many, one uh, method of searching for knowledge among many. So when we say a philosophy or philosopher here, we are referring to that more comprehensive notion. First, that philosopher and then that scholar each authored a book about this, about the bejeweled, beautifully written uh, Quran that is signifying those lofty meanings. Fakat, philosophun kitabı yalnız harflerin nakışlarından ve münasebetlerinden ve vaziyetlerinden ve cevherlerinin hasiyetlerinden ve tarifatından bahseder. Manasına hiç ilişmez. Çünkü o ecnebi adam Arabi hattı okumayı hiç bilmez. Hatta o müzeyyen Kur'an'ı bilmiyor ki bir kitaptır ve manayı ifade eden yazıdır. Belki ona münakkaş bir antika nazarıyla bakıyor. Lakin çendan Arabi bilmiyor fakat çok iyi bir mühendistir, güzel bir tasvircidir, mahir bir kimyagerdir, sanraf bir cevhercidir. İşte o adam bu sanatlara göre eserini yazdı. However, now they both wrote their works, authored a book about this. However, the philosopher's book mentioned only the embroideries of the letters. Their relations and positions. So this letter is written with gold and uh, it is three centimeters big and one inch wide. It is elevated from the surface, you know, so much. Uh, the gold is uh, shining. I don't know, so the, the light that's emanated from the gold is you know, so, so many lumens and, you know, he, he wrote about these embroideries and the relations and positions of the letters, this H or this is in Arabic, right? This, this Ha is placed to the left of that, that gym and the, you know, Ha is t t slightly lower than the Elif and the Elif is slightly above the Ha on the page. And so on and so forth. He wrote about the, the embroideries of the letters and their relations and positions and the properties and the descriptions of their substances. He analyzed the, the material, the substance that each one of the letters is uh, you know, written and so on and so forth. Yet, yet this philosopher's book work on treaties on this, on this uh, Quran. It did not touch on its meanings, the Quran's meanings, at all. It was only about the physical qualities and the relations, wisdoms, between those physical qualities. It did not touch upon the meaning at all. 
it was as if those meanings did not exist because that European man did not know how to read the Arabic script at all he did not know he did not know that that, that these letters had meanings he did not know how to read it he did not even know that that adorned Quran is a book I mean he was amazed he, he was in admiration he liked it he noticed the beauty and the chemistry and the engineering and so on and so forth in, in it but he did not even know that that adorned quran is a book a script expressing a meaning he did not notice that all of these things had meanings in fact he views it as an embroidered antique a, a precious item a precious thing right that's worth a lot of money because because it is uh, you know physically beautiful that's it nevertheless even though he does not know Arabic he is a very good engineer a very good sketcher a skillful chemist and an expert jeweler thus that man composed his work according to these crafts engineer sketcher chemist jeweler biologist i don't know whatever medical doctor uh, sociologist zoologist astronomer he he had all these arts and crafts he knew them all and he composed his work about this quran according to those crafts according to the the wisdoms that could be could be attained by using the tools and methods and questions of those arts and crafts amma müslüman alim ise ona baktığı vakit anladı ki o kitabı mübindir kur'an hakimdir as for the muslim scholar when he looked he understood that that was the clear book and this is a phrase from the Quran clear book kitab mubin it was the wisdomful Quran it was the Quran that is filled with wisdoms meanings deeper realities işte bu hakperest zat ne tezinat zahirisine ehemmiyet verdi ve ne de hurufun nukuşuyla iştigal etti. Belki öyle bir şeyle meşgul oldu ki milyon mertebe öteki adamın iştigal ettiği meselelerinden daha ali, daha gali, daha latif, daha şerif, daha nafi, daha cami. So this truthful person neither paid attention to the outward adornments nor occupied himself with the embroideries of the letters. Now, he did not say they are not beautiful. He did appreciate that. He did appreciate that. But that he understood that that was not what was worthy of attention in this thing. He neither paid attention to the outward adornments, nor occupied himself with the embroideries of the letters. He dealt with such a thing that it is a million times loftier more precious subtler more honorable more beneficial and more comprehensive than the matters that the other man had dealt with so it is loftier more precious subtler more honorable more beneficial and more comprehensive than the matters that the other man had dealt with Çünkü nukuşun perdesi altında olan hakaik kutsiyesinden ve envar esrarından bahsederek gayet güzel bir tefsir-i şerif yazdı. Because he wrote an utmostly beautiful, honorable commentary. Remember, he is writing a work on the Quran, on a book, and he is writing a commentary, commentary on it. He wrote an utmostly beautiful, honorable commentary by talking about the book's sacred truths and most hidden lights under the veil of those embroideries so those embroideries he understood are veils uh, embroidered veils they are there to attract your attention but once you pay attention they are not there for you to to focus on no they are 
transparent veils they are there like the, like the packaging if you will you go to the market and you know you go look you are looking at these shelves and you know there are lots of things well, what are you going to buy let's be naughty here you are going to buy a candy candy bars they are packaged in these colorful shiny you know pieces of paper and plastic is that what you you are there for is that what you are aiming for when you are looking at those shelves the packaging no the packaging is there to attract your attention once you uh, once something catches your eye you take it and you try to understand what is in it and let's say you want you know, hazelnut chocolate well you will look at the ingredients and if it is not hazelnut chocolate but something else you will put it back no matter how beautiful the packaging is you will not focus on the packaging you are interested in what is inside the package right so this man understood that this packaging was packaging and there was something in it and he was not meant to focus on the packaging and write a book about the packaging but rather to write about the food the nutrition the the the blessing whatever that beautiful thing is inside the packaging under the veil behind the veil he wrote an utmost beautiful honorable commentary by talking about the book sacred truths and most hidden lights under the veil of those embroideries sonra ikisi eserlerini götürüp o hakim izişana takdim ettiler then they both took their works to that honorable ruler and presented to him. O hakim evvela filosofun eserini aldı, baktı, gördü ki o hotpesent ve tabiat perest adam çok çalışmış fakat hiç hakiki hikmetini yazmamış. Hiçbir manasını anlamamış. Belki karıştırmış. Ona karşı hürmetsizlik, belki edepsizlik etmiş. Çünkü onun bağı hak- hakaik olan Kur'an'ı manasız nukuş zannederek mana cihetinde kıymetsizlikle tahkir etmiş olduğundan o hakim hakim dahi onun eserini başına vurdu huzurundan çıkardı that ruler first took the philosopher's book he looked and saw that that conceited and nature worshipping man had worked a lot now why conceited and not nature worshipping it is his conceit it is his um self-centeredness it is his admiration of himself and his intellect that makes him think that he knows it all that makes him think that what he perceives it what is out there and prevents him from looking beyond what he perceives that prevents him from you know lowering lowering his gaze and looking down looking perhaps if he is looking at that veil and that's a transparent veil that has the the this this fiber that it is made of but there are these whole spaces between the fibers he is not lowering his gaze to see through those holes between the fibers but he is so amazed about his his skill and his expertise on the qualities of the fiber that all he can see is the fiber he doesn't see what is beyond it that ruler first took the philosopher's book he looked and saw that that conceited and nature worshipping man he is worshipping the fiber had worked a lot but had not written about its true the book's true wisdom at all he had not understood any of its meanings in fact he had mixed things up he had been disrespectful and ill-mannered toward it since he had insulted that quran which is the font of truths as being valueless in terms of meaning by presuming it to be the meaningless embroideries that he perceived there the all-wise ruler struck that man's work on his head and expelled him from his presence Sonra öteki hakperest müdakkik alimin eserine baktı. Gördü ki gayet güzel ve nafi bir tefsir ve gayet hakimane, mürşidane bir teliftir. Aferin, Allah dedi. İşte hikmet budur ve alim ve ha- hakim bunun sahibine derler. 
Öteki adam ise haddinden tecavüz etmiş bir sanatkardır. Sonra onun eserine bir mükafat olarak her bir harfine mukabil tükenmez hazinesinden 10 altın verilsin irade etti. And then he, this, this uh, renowned ruler, looked at the work of that truthful and discerning scholar. He saw that it is an utmostly beautiful and beneficial commentary. Commentary, that's important. right? It is a commentary on the meanings. An utmostly wisdomful and rightly guiding work of authorship. Well done. May God bless you, he said. This is wisdom and it is the owner of this who deserves to be called a scholar and a wise person. The other man is a craftsperson who has exceeded his bounds. So there's a difference between a wise person and a craftsperson. A wise person is the person who sees wisdom. A craftsperson is the person who can connect things to one another, who can attach things to one another. That is a kind of wisdom too, but in a very shallow and limited sense. It is not the true wisdom of things. Right? It is mechanical. It is mechanical attachments and he is able to see those mechanical connections and even imitate them and even as an engineer would do even able to replicate them and put them to use and etc etc but the other man is a craftsperson he does not understand the meanings he cannot grasp the true wisdom which is the deeper meaning under the veil then as a reward for his work for the work of this uh, truthful and discerning scholar he the ruler commanded his will to have 10 pieces of gold for each of its letters the commentary is letters to be given out of his inexhaustible treasury eğer temsili fehmettinse bak hakikatin yüzünü de gör if you understood the representation now look See the face of the truth too. Ama o müzeyyen Kur'an ise şu musannake aynattır. O hakim ise hakimi ezelidir ve o iki adam ise birisi yani ecnebisi ilmi felsefe, hükeması, felsefe ve hükemasıdır. Diğeri Kur'an ve şakitleridir. As for that, now this is the, the, the, the reality of things, right? This is the truth that's coming. What is the true meaning that this representational story is representing as for that adorned quran the bejeweled the beautifully written quran it is this artful cosmos this is important the cosmos the universe that we live in the sensible realm and everything in it it is a quran what is a quran a quran is comes from the word qara to to to read to read something made to be read and understood something to be read to comprehend the meanings that it signifies it is a signifier as for that adorned quran it is this artful cosmos this cosmos that is filled with signs of art history as for that ruler, he is the eternal all-wise one. God who knows the wisdom of everything, who created the wisdom of everything, and he who created everything with wisdom, who knows the deepest, most profound, the broadest wisdom that is being sowed in everything. As for those two men, one, that is the European, is the science of philosophy and the possessors of its wisdom. And we explained what we understand uh, uh, from philosophy in this context. The other is the Quran and its disciples. So if it were written in more modern language, in a language that would not 
uh, you know, comprehend a longer period of history that would probably extend all the way back to like maybe like two, three thousand years, right? Instead of philosophy, we could have used the word science here because that's what we usually mean by the word science science of history science of sociology science of chemistry science of biology those were all included in philosophy as for those two men one that is the european because that is what um what the source of modern science is is right it originated in europe that is european is the science of philosophy and the possessors of its wisdom so we are not saying there is no wisdom what we are saying is it is mechanical and shallow it does not take us to the the the reality to the the deeper more profound and true uh, more significant wisdom that really matters the other is the quran and its disciples evet quran hakim şu quran azim kainatın en ali bir müfessiridir ve en beli bir tercümanıdır. Now the relations in the representation story are like becoming more clear here and it's, it's, this is an important uh, in, in, important point to pay attention to. Yes. The wisdomful Quran is a most lofty commentator and most eloquent translator of this tremendous Quran of the cosmos. There are two Qurans we are talking about. One is the wisdomful Quran, the 6,600 something verses that are revealed to the Prophet وسلم, from God by angel Gabriel, the wisdomful Quran, Quran Hakim. It is a most lofty commentator. It is written in such a bejeweled way, in such a beautiful fashion, right? The, the miraculousness of the Quran is in its eloquence. Its eloquence is worth diamonds and agates and pearls and brilliance and, and what emeralds, right? Its eloquence is a, an embroidery an ornamentation and adornment the wisdomful quran is a most lofty commentator but the important thing here is that eloquence is is, to, is to, to attract you and to signify and honor the deep meanings that are contained in it is a most lofty commentator it is commenting on those meanings and most eloquent translator of what this tremendous quran of the cosmos the creation and where does the creation this eloquent tremendous quran of the cosmos gets get its meaning and worth god it is the manifestation of god's names and attributes the reality of things in the creation is the manifestation of god's names and attributes in that sense the dunya, the lowly world, is not lowly. In that sense, it is lofty. What is lowly, what is lowly is the physical substance. And if you were to, to focus on that physical substance, we would go nowhere. It is a veil. It is useful. It is necessary. It has wisdom. It serves many purposes. But it is not the end that we are seeking the end we are seeking is those comments those lofty comments that we are being taught by the eloquent translator which is the wisdomful quran evet o furkandır ki şu kainatın sahifelerinde ve zamanların yapraklarında Kalemi kudretle yazılan ayat-ı tekviniyeyi cin ve inse ders verir. Yes, it is that criterion, Furkan. Right? That's one of the uh, titles of the Quran. The criterion, that which separates truth from falsehood. That which shows reality as reality is. Yes, 
it is that criterion that teaches to the jinn and humans conscious beings who have partial will who are able to choose between good and bad beautiful and ugly true and false it is that criterion that teaches the jinn and humans who can what criterion is this uh, the Furqan is literally separator that separates truth from falsehood ugly from beautiful good from bad it is that criterion that separator that teaches to the jinn and humans the signs of creation that are inscribed on the pages of this cosmos and the folios of time with the pen of power the pages of this cosmos the sensible realm that we see and the folios of time there is not one cosmos there is not one universe it is being created anew every moment billions trillions like endless number of cosmoses creations what are they what are they they are signs of creation they are the pages and folios for the the signs of creation to be written they are signifiers it is the quran that separator that criterion that teaches those meanings those signified meanings to the jinn and humans hem her biri birer harfi mani dar olan mevcudata manayı harfi nazarıyla yani onlara sani hesabına bakar ne kadar güzel yapılmış ne kadar güzel bir surette sani inince maline delalet ediyor der ve bununla kainatın hakiki güzelliğini gösteriyor moreover it beholds the existent beings which are each a meaningful letter from the point of view of their indicative meaning that is in the name of the artful maker it says how beautifully it is made how beautifully does it indicate the beauty of its artful maker and it shows the true beauty of the cosmos in this way now this phrase indicative meaning is very important Ustad Nursi says that in his 40 years of life and 30 something years of studying and he says this he writes this when he was around 40 there are four things four words that he learned this is one of them and the other is a nominative meaning the, the other one is the counterpart to this so they are uh, intention viewpoint manai harfi manai ismi intention viewpoint uh, nominative meaning indicative meaning and he he borrows this from the arabic grammar in arabic grammar a, an ism a noun is something that indicates a meaning in itself I mean, if you want to be more precise without connection to time and a verb is is something a an utterance rather a meaningful utterance that indicates a meaning in itself in connection to time but to make things easier we are going to put the verb aside and we are going to think about the noun right a meaningful utterance that indicates a meaning in itself without connection to time that is ism that is noun the important part here is that it indicates a meaning in itself when i say a a cup right so the cup is something this these three uh letters c u p cup indicate a meaning a, a thing a hollow thing in which we can put things and drink from it etc and then there is a third category of utterances in the arabic language words uh, in the arabic language these are huruf, uh, the, um, articles they do not have or sometimes propositions they, they do not have meanings in and of themselves however when used in a sentence when or or in a phrase when used in connection with other words that are nouns or verbs then they enrich the meaning of those words acquire a meaning themselves and enrich the meaning of the total phrase they indicate something else beyond themselves the, this exists in in english too let's think about propositions let's think about the proposition on right on what does it mean on 
something. We have to say something. Unless we say something, it doesn't have a meaning. It is it, because it's, it's it's a relative concept. So I can say on the table. The cup is on the table. Now this has a meaning. Now this word on related the cup to the table. So it relates one thing to another, right? It it indicates something beyond itself. So manaya harfi, a meaning that is attached to a harf, this category of words in Arabic, right? That's an indicative meaning that indicates something beyond the word itself. Manaya ismi is a meaning that's attached to the word itself because that word has an indication in and of itself, right? So everything in the creation has a manai ismi and a manai harfi, a nominative meaning and an indicative meaning. The nominative meaning of the tree is, is, is, is the tree. The physical, chemical, biological, so on and so forth, thing that the tree is. It bears fruit, it has leaves, it has shade, and then it dies. And this appears, rots, mixes into soil. The indicative meaning of the tree is that it indicates its creator. And that is what really matters. That is the point. That is the, the true wisdom in the tree. The true wisdom is the indicative meaning. Moreover, it, the, the uh, wisdomful Quran, and here we are talking about reality, right? The Quran, which is a commentator of the, the cosmos. Moreover, it beholds the existent beings, which are each a meaningful letter from the point of view of their indicative meaning. That is, in the name of the artful maker. In the name of the artful maker. Who is the artful maker? It is God. In the name of God. It says how beautifully it is made. It does not say how beautiful it is. It says how beautifully it is made. How beautifully does it indicate the beauty of its artful maker? That is what matters. When we say Masha Allah, right? What God has created. How beautifully God has created. Saying how beautiful it is, well, maybe it is true. It is not false, but it is insolent. It, it misses the point. It misses the point. And it shows the true beauty of the cosmos in this way. It misses the true beauty. The true beauty is not in the mechanical, physical substance that the cosmos is made of. Is that it's not there. The true beauty is in the meaning that is behind this veil that the cosmos is. Amma ilmi hikmet dedikleri felsefe ise hurufu mevcudatın tezinatında ve münasebata münasebatında dalmış ve sersemleşmiş. Hakikatin yolunu şaşırmış. Şu kitabı kebirin hurufatına manayı harfi ile yani Allah hesabına bakmak lazım gelirken öyle etmeyip manayı ismiyle yani mevcudata mevcudat hesabına bakar. Öyle bahseder. Ne güzel yapılmışa bedel ne güzeldir der. Çirkinleştirir. Bununla kainatı tahkir edip kendisine müşteki eder. Evet dinsiz felsefe hakikatsiz bir safsatadır ve kainata bir tahkirdir. Now. As for the philosophy that they call the science of wisdom. And of course there is a level of sarcasm here. As for the philosophy that they call the science of wisdom. ilm hikmet. And that's, that's one way that uh, traditionally Muslims using Arabic language or languages that have borrowed from Arabic have referred to philosophy. ilm hikmet. Knowledge of wisdom or science of wisdom. As for the philosophy that they call the science of wisdom, but they call, right? There, there is there is sarcasm. There is that notion saying they call it that, but it is not that. It is not the knowledge of wisdom. It is not the knowledge of true wisdom. True wisdom is something else. As for the philosophy that they call the science of wisdom, it has lost sense by plunging into the adornments and relationships of the letters of the existent existent beings. 
it has lost sense by plunging into the mechanical connections that are out there it has lost the path of truth while it is due to look at the letters of this great book through indicative meanings that is in the name of god it has not that that philosophy has not done that so it has not done that it has not looked through the indicative meanings and it has looked through the nominative meanings that is it looks at the existent beings in the name of the existent beings be all and all and talks about them as such it does not see beyond it thinks that that what it perceives in the sensible realm the phenomena that if you were to use that a more philosophical term the phenomena is just the phenomena there's nothing beyond it no meaning no meaning either you know when we move more complex to to more modern philosophy it will either say well whether there is meaning or not we we, we don't know it we cannot access it. it it's unknowable to us even though the one who knows it says this is the meaning right it, it rejects it's it's so um out of its vain glory it refuses to listen to the one that says what it is either that's the case or or it doesn't see any meaning beyond it. it it just does not see beyond the phenomenon that it is perceiving right it has not done that it has not looked at things with the indicative meaning it has looked through the nominative meanings that is it looks at the existent beings in the name of the existent beings and talks about them as such instead of how beautiful it is made so that's the point right all of this boils down to our ability and duty to appreciate the beauty that we see out there the complex perfection that we see out there as a sign of the source of beauty and the source of perfection for us to say how beautifully it is made for us to recognize that it is made instead of that instead of saying how beautiful it is made it says how beautiful it is and makes it ugly makes it ugly because in this case that outer beauty which in reality is the package which in reality is an adornment in order to attract your attention and present the inner reality the the true meaning the true wisdom right is now reduced to just what it is in the sensible realm it becomes a veil not a transparent veil but an opaque veil it loses its function it actually becomes the opposite of what it is meant to be your medicine turns into your poison the medicine if and when used in the uh, in the correct way right it's going to heal you it's going to cure you it's going to give you something beautiful but because you misuse it it turns into poison it becomes ugly instead of how beautiful it is made it says how beautiful it is and makes it ugly it insults the cosmos in this way and turns it into a plaintiff against itself that philosophy turns the cosmos into a plaintiff against itself all of these existent beings the trees the birds the flowers the cup the desk the the the, the, the carpet the dust the the molecule the star the galaxy each and every one of them will complain before god saying this is what we were created for this is what that thing that's called philosophy and its uh, adherence or that thing that is called science in the modern world and its adherence reduced us to they use that seemingly sophisticated discourse in order to, to to reduce us to meaningless substances and relationships between substances they insulted us 
Yes, philosophy without religion is a sophistry without truth and an insult against the cosmos. Now, it is useful. It is beneficial. It can yield much good. It has yielded much good. We do not reject science altogether. We embrace science. Science is a means for us to see more of that beauty. Science is a means for us to, uh, you know, instead of thinking that there are four elements out there, you know, air uh, or, or, or wind, fire, uh, earth, water, right? Instead of thinking there are, you know, four elements out there, science is what makes us to see that there are you know, more than a hundred elements. Science is what helps us to see uh, instead of the, the visible stars on the firmament on, on a clear night, to see millions, billions more, millions, not millions, billions, billions of more signs of creation. Science is what enables us to see all that beauty and perfection, all those signs of creation in the microcosmic world. Science is beautiful. Science is useful. Science enables us to make the medicine, to cure people, etc., etc. However, however, that is not the ultimate purpose. If it turns into a veil that prevents us from being able to seek and attain the ultimate purpose, it's an insult against the cosmos. It is ugly. We need to put things to where they belong to. We need to put things where they belong to. And that's a definition of justice. All right. Inshallah, we will continue the 12th word in our next episode. We read the first principle in it, and there are four of those principles. Subhanaka la ilma lana illa ma allamtana innaka anta al-alimul hakim. Wa akhir al-dawahum anilhamdulillahi rabbil alameen al-fatiha.